Hi everyone! Welcome to part 3 of chapter 15. Today we are going to continue talking about Le Chatelier's principle and equilibrium. Last time we talked about Le Chatelier's principle with respect to the concentration of the reactants. What happens to the position of the equilibrium if we increase or decrease um, you know, the concentration of the reactants or we increase or decrease the concentration of the products? Today we are going to look at other factors that can affect the position of the equilibrium. So one of the factors is changing the volume, okay? So let's say that after the equilibrium is established, right? We had that initial rate, you know, the forward reaction went really fast, and then eventually the, you know, the forward reaction was equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Okay, so after this time, now we are going to decrease the volume of the container. So I want to look at how will that affect the concentrations of the solids, liquids, solutions, and gases. And then how will that affect the total pressure of solids, liquids, and gases? And how will it affect the value of K? All right, so when we decrease the volume of the container, that is going to increase the concentration of the gases in the container because we're not changing the number of moles, right? But what we're changing is the, you know, is the liters. So if the liters become smaller, right, we're, you know, decreasing the volume, that means our concentration will increase because we're dividing by a smaller number. Okay, so decreasing the volume will increase the concentration. And concentration is directly related to the pressure of the gas, right? Remember, when we talk about pressure, we're always going to talk about the number of collisions, okay? And so if we're increasing the concentration, that means we're going to increase the number of collisions that are happening, which increases the pressure, okay? If we, you know, increase the pressure of the gas, we are increasing, you know, the partial pressures of each individual gas, Okay. It doesn't change the concentration of solutions, and if you'll recall, we don't care about solids and we don't care about liquids, right? We're not going to include them in our equilibrium expression. The only thing we're worried about are our solutions, right? Our aqueous solutions and our gases. So if we decrease the volume of the container, that is going to increase the concentration of the gas, but it doesn't change the concentration of the solution because, you know, liquids, right, have a set volume. Um, if all of these partial pressures increase, right, we made it smaller, so now the partial pressure of each of the gases increase, which means that the total pressure in the container will increase. Um, that's Dalton's law of partial press pressure. So if you think about it, you know, P1 plus P2 plus however many, you know, gases are in there, it's always going to equal the total pressure, right? Those are all additive. That's Dalton's law of partial pressure. So if we start increasing all of these partial pressures, then that means our total pressure will increase as well. Um, so the way that this plays out with Le Chatelier's principle, when um, we are decreasing the volume of the container, right, that is applying um, a stress to the system, right? We have, we have increased the pressure in the system. Um, and the way that the equilibrium will move, it will shift to relieve the pressure. Um, and the way that it relieves the pressure is it's going to reduce the number of gas molecules in the container. So we're going to look at the coefficients, right? If you'll remember when we were looking at K versus KP, and we added up the coefficients on each side of the equation to figure out how many moles of, you know, of gas were on each side. We're going to do the same thing here. Um, it's going to shift to the side with fewer gas molecules. So if you add up the gas coefficients on each side, it will shift to the side that has you know fewer okay um, and then at this new equilibrium position the partial pressures of the gaseous reactants and products will be such that you know the value of the equilibrium constant is always the same remember um, it doesn't matter what pressures we start with or you know what concentrations we start with at a given temperature the equilibrium constant when we plug it in that k expression is always going to end up being the same the, you know, the, the pressures themselves or the concentrations themselves will be different, but when you plug them into that equation, it will come out so that K is always a constant. Okay, so let's sum this up. So when we have a change in volume, um, which, you know, thereby causes a change in pressure, um, it will have no effect on the equilibrium whatsoever if they have the same number of molecules on each side. And remember, this is just gases. So if you have any like aqueous solutions or solids, just leave them out when you're adding things up. But let's say you had two moles of gas on each side and you change the volume. 
Well, that's not going to have any effect whatsoever on the equilibrium, and it will stay exactly as it is. However, if the number of moles is different on the two sides of the reaction, then the pressure changes, right? Whether we're increasing or decreasing the pressure, right, will have a big effect on the equilibrium. So just remember this. If you have a high pressure, right, or a very small volume, then you're going to shift to less moles of the gas, okay? You can think about higher pressure is usually due to decreasing the volume. And if we're decreasing the volume, you can think about it like there's less room for gas molecules, right? And if there's less room, then we want to shift to the side with fewer moles of gas. Okay, so let's look at how this plays out. Um, so we have a closed container of dinitrogen tetroxide and nitrogen dioxide. It's at equilibrium. And then we increase the pressure. So here's my reaction. Okay, so again, anytime we're increasing the pressure or decreasing the pressure, we're going to look at the coefficients in front of the gases. Both of these are gases, right? And our energy doesn't matter at all right now. Um, but both of these are gases. So we're going to look at the coefficient. There's only one gaseous mole on that side and two over here. Okay, so when we increase the pressure, you know, again, that's usually due to decreasing the volume. So we have less room for gas. So we need to switch to the side, right? Shift to the side that has fewer gas molecules. So we're going to go ahead and shift left here um, to restore the equilibrium because there are less moles of gas on that side. Okay, here's just showing it a different way. Um, so this is, you know, a cylinder and it's got a piston. And, you know, we're increasing the pressure by, again, decreasing the volume. And when we decrease the volume, we want to shift to the side with fewer moles of gas. So again, these are all gases, which is great. And so we're going to look at the coefficient. There's nothing here, and there's a 3 here. So 1 plus 3 gives us 4 on this side, and this side has a 2. Okay. So since we're increasing the pressure, right, we're decreasing that volume, we want to shift to the side with fewer moles of gas. So we're going to shift towards the products because there are only 2 gaseous moles on that side and 4 gaseous moles on the reactant side. The opposite is also true. So let's say we decrease the pressure by increasing the volume. Well, now there's lots of space, right? So we can shift to the side that has more moles of gas because there's lots of room for these gas molecules to be around. So again, there were four on this side and two on this side. So when we decrease the, the pressure, we're increasing the volume, we're going to shift to the side with more gaseous moles. Okay. All right, other things. Um, so that was looking at, you know, pressure and volume. Remember, pressure and volume are always going to be that, you know, uh, inversely proportional, but they're directly related. Um, if we add a gaseous reactant, so we're going to dump in more gas, okay? And this is one that shows up in the equation. And I've, I've emphasized that here because sometimes you'll other, add other gases. Um, but if you add one that is a reactant, well, that's going to act just like adding... Um, more of a solution. Those, you know, like the concentrations we were looking at last time. If we increase the concentration, you know, of a reactant, then it would shift away from it, right? It's going to shift to the right towards the products, um, be, you know, to relieve that, that stress. Okay, so um, these partial pressures of these gases work exactly the same way. If we are going to increase um, or we're going to add a bunch more reactant that increases the partial pressure of that reactant. And now, you know, your equilibrium is like, whoa, too much reactant. Let's go ahead and shift. We're going to use it up and go make a bunch of product. Okay. Um, so you can think of increasing the partial pressure. It also increases the concentration. So you can think of those as being essentially having the same effect. Um, it does not increase the partial pressure of any other gases in the mixture. Remember, gas particles are very, very small, and they are very far apart. So the fact that you added more gas into your um, container really doesn't affect any of the other gases, okay? We're just looking at um, that gas by itself. Related to that, if you dump in a gas that is not in your reaction, an inert gas, say you dumped in a bunch of, you know, neon or something, um, it is not going to impact your reaction at all because it doesn't show up in your reaction. It is inert, it is unreactive, right? This would be like neon or argon. Maybe you, you know, found some helium you wanted to dump in there. Any of those noble gases that aren't going to react. It has no position or no effect on the position of the equilibrium because it's not doing anything to your reaction. Again, these gas particles are really, 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 really small. And so the fact that you dump in some more really, really small gas particles doesn't change um, the position of the equilibrium. 
It will increase the total pressure in there, but it's not affecting the partial pressures of these gases, which are what matters, okay? So adding an inert gas has no effect on the position of the equilibrium. It's not gonna shift it left or right, they're just gonna hang out. Okay, changing temperature does have a big effect on the position of the equilibrium, okay? Because we have two different types of reactions, right? We have endothermic reactions, and we have exothermic reactions. Um, and these two will behave very differently with respect to temperature. What I recommend is to always write heat as either a reactant or a product, and then you're going to treat heat just like you would any other reactant or product, okay? Just like we were dealing with concentrations or something like that. Um, and this will help us see whether it's going to shift left or right. Remember, if it's exothermic, it's going to release energy. So that means you're going to write plus heat on the product side. And if it's endothermic, then it's going to absorb energy. So you're gonna write plus heat on the reactant side. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what I mean with this. So if we have an exothermic reaction, heat is a product, right? Over time, heat is being produced, it leaves, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to go ahead and write plus heat on the right hand side because it's a product so we know it's you know somebody told us it's exothermic you're not going to you know need to figure that out um what you may do though is I, I may give you like an a delta h and if you see that it is negative that means it's exothermic okay if delta h is positive that means it's endothermic so i may do that um, but I won't just give you a reaction and ask you to predict whether it's endothermic or exothermic. Um, so let's say I gave you delta H was a negative value of something. Then you would go ahead and write plus heat on the product side. Okay, so now let's say we increased the temperature. Increasing the temperature is effectively adding heat, right? So you're going to treat this just like any other substance. So if we increase the temperature, I'm dumping in a bunch of heat. Well, if I am increasing the amount of heat right? Then my reaction is going to shift, okay, this way. Um, ignore this. I think I had this backwards earlier. Um, but if you uh, increase, this is for removing, if you increase the amount of heat, you're, you're going to treat this as an increase here, and your reaction will shift left towards the reactants to use up that added heat, okay? Um, the stuff that I crossed out would be if you removed heat, which you know, essentially will work the exact same way. If I removed heat, then my reaction would shift to replace the heat, okay? Again, treat heat just like any other reactant or product, okay? So if we add heat, then it's gonna shift away from it. If we remove heat, then it's going to shift towards it. Okay. All right, again, adding heat to an exothermic reaction will end up decreasing, right? So if we're, if we're you know, going this way, right, if these are reactants and these are products, when we shift, you know, to the left, that will decrease the concentration of all the products and it will increase the concentration of all of the reactants, okay? So remember, when we write our value of K, it's always products over reactants. Whether these are concentrations or partial pressures, it doesn't matter, it's always products over reactants. So if we are decreasing the amount of product and we are increasing the amount of reactant, that tells us that K is going to go down, right? We're going to decrease our value of K if we add heat to an exothermic reaction. Um, and then, so the opposite will also be true. If we decrease the temperature, right? So um, for an exothermic reaction, we would have plus heat on this side. If we decrease the temperature, that's going to cause our reaction to shift towards what we removed. Okay, and so if we're shifting towards it now, if we go this way, right, if we have reactants and products, that will cause, right, we're shifting right, that will cause an increase in the amount of products, a decrease in the amount of reactants, and so then K would increase. Okay, again, the key to this is writing plus heat on the correct side so that you can treat it just like any other reactant or product. Okay. So here, this is an endothermic reaction now, and heat is a reactant. So we've put um, he plus heat on the left-hand side. So let's say, um, oh, sorry, when, when I might write this in a problem, this would be delta H is a positive value, okay? 
Um, so here's our example, right? I've put plus heat on the left-hand side. And if we increase temperature, just like we were talking about before, if we increase temperature, we are adding heat. And if we add heat, that's going to increase our concentration of heat. So our reaction will shift away from it. It will shift to the other side um, to relieve that pressure, right? To use up that added heat. Um, and then, so when we think about this, right, we have a larger K because K is always going to be products over reactants. And we are, if we are shifting, right, to the right, we are increasing the amount of products. We are decreasing the amount of reactants. So if we increase products while decreasing reactants, that means K is going to increase. Okay, and that all is stated here. If you add heat to an endothermic reaction, we'll decrease the concentration of the reactants, increase the concentration of the products, we'll, so therefore it will increase the value of K. All right, let's go ahead and look at an example. Let's say we have a closed container of ice and water at equilibrium, okay? So we would know that, you know, ice, and if we heat it up, then we get water, right? Melting our ice is an endothermic reaction, so heat would go on the side with the ice. And then I've raised the temperature. Since I have heat already in my equation here, I can treat it just like any other reactant, right? I'm gonna go ahead and increase my heat, which means that my reaction will shift to the right to use up all of that added heat. Remember, we're always going to shift away from whatever we add and toward whatever we remove. Okay, so this is how you might see it. Um, we actually, in the lab, uh, have this substance, right? We have, you know, dinitrogen tetroxide in this glass tube, and we keep it in the freezer so that it's nice and cold, um, and it's clear. At low temperatures, N2O4 is favored, right? Because if you, you know, decrease heat, that means it's going to shift towards the reactant side, okay? So at very, very cold temperatures, we have a colorless gas tube. But if we increase the heat, right, let's say we take it out of the, the fridge or the freezer um, and we leave it on the counter for a while. Well, over time, that increases our heat. So now it's going to shift to the right and our gas tube turns brown, which is cool. So that's the nitrogen dioxide. We actually uh, produce this gas during one of the reactions in uh, Chem 1. When we do that copper reaction lab, in the very first step, uh, you add, you know, nitric acid and you produced nitrogen dioxide, and it was brown, and we had to do it in the hood, and it was really smelly. So if you remember that, we actually produced this. We just didn't capture it, um, but we could have, right? And we could have cooled it down and made it colorless, which is really cool. All right, on to more topics. So catalysts. We talked a lot about catalysts um, in the last chapter, and catalysts, remember, really affect the rate of the reaction. Right, there are two different types of catalysts. We look at heterogeneous catalysts and homogeneous catalysts, um, and they work via different mechanisms, right? Um, some, you know, the, the heterogeneous catalysts are often used to kind of hold your molecules in place while the reaction happens. Um, and then homogeneous molecules are usually used, you know, to make intermediates. Regardless, though, both of these provide an alternate, more efficient mechanism, which is why those reaction rates go faster. Um, but the thing is that the catalysts work for both the forward reaction and the reverse reaction. So they're affecting the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction by the same amount. Okay, so since they're both being affected, the catalysts do not affect the position of the equilibrium. So yes, they're making the forward, re you know, the forward reaction go faster, but they're also making the reverse reaction go faster. Um, so the fact that you add a catalyst makes the reaction go faster, but it doesn't affect the position of the equilibrium. All right, here's another practice problem. Closed container of uh, dinitrogen tetroxide and nitrogen dioxide at equilibrium. Here we are. So I have a bunch of uh, different examples, and I want you to figure out which way does the equilibrium shift in each of the following scenarios. So you have eight different scenarios, and this will cover um, everything we've talked about with Le Chatelier's principle. So what I want you to do is go ahead and pause here and do these problems. And so the answers are either going to be left or right. You just need to figure out which one it is. So go ahead, pause here, come back when you're ready to see the answers. All 
All right, let's go over this. <clears throat> so if I add dinitrogen tetroxide, we're adding dinitrogen tetroxide. So our reaction needs to shift away from that, right? It needs to shift the other direction to use it up. So in this case, we will shift to the right. If we increase the pressure, remember, if we increase the pressure, this is likely happening because the volume has decreased. So if we decrease our volume, again, I go through this whole thought process every time, right? Decreasing our volume, that means that there are, is less room in our container. Okay, so if there's less room, then I want to shift towards the side with less moles of the gas. Um, here we have one, right? Imaginary one on that side, and we have two on this side. And we're going to shift towards the side with less moles of the gas, therefore we are going to shift left. All right, if we add heat, heat is the same thing as energy, right? You can write it either way. If I add heat or I increase the temperature, right, we're going to treat this like any other reactant. So I added a bunch of energy. That means it's going to shift away from it, going to shift to the other side to use up that added heat. If I remove nitrogen dioxide, remember, anytime we remove a substance, our equilibrium is going to shift toward that substance so that it can be replaced, right? We need to make more of it. So we are going to shift to the right to make more of that nitrogen dioxide. If I increase the volume, whoop, spoiler alert, if I increase the volume, um, that means there's going to be more room, right, in our container. Well, if there's more room, then we're going to shift to the side with more moles of a gas. Again, we have one on this side, two on this side, so we're going to go ahead and shift right here so um, to relieve that stress. If I remove heat by cooling down that temperature, right, so that's the same as energy. If I remove energy, then we're going to shift toward the energy to replace it. So we're going to go left in this case. If I remove dinitrogen tetroxide, okay, so that's a reactant over here. If I remove that, again, we're going to shift towards it to replace what we've removed. So we're going to go ahead and shift left. And then if a catalyst is added, we were just talking about catalysts, and I told you catalysts do not affect the position of the equilibrium. So this one would have no effect whatsoever. It's not going to go right or left because it affects the forward reaction and the reverse reaction by the same amount. Let's try another one. So here we have an equation, um, and here I've included this as kilojoules. Okay, again, this is the same as heat or energy right? You can see it written all kinds of different ways. So when the temperature is increased, the equilibrium will shift. So I want to know, does it shift left or right? And when it does shift left or right, what happens to the HBr? What happens to the hydrobromic acid? So go ahead and pause here, figure out which way it shifts and what happens. Okay. If I increase the temperature, that means I'm increasing the amount of kilojoules that are in my system. So I'm increasing the amount of kilojoules, and when that happens, I need to have my equilibrium shift away from what I've added to use up that added heat. Okay, so it's going to go ahead and shift to the right. So we know it's not C, we know it's not D. So when it shifts to the right, um, the way that it does that, right, we're going to go make a bunch of products. And the way that we make a bunch of products is we end up using up our reactants. So when it shifts to the right, make it a ton of products, used up reactants. Therefore, our concentration of HBr will decrease. Okay, here's another example. So ammonia is commercially uh, produced by the Haber reaction, which is nitrogen reacting with hydrogen to produce ammonia. It's a really common reaction. Um, and so I want to know which of these will favor the formation of ammonia. And all it means by favoring the formation of ammonia is which one of these will make it go and make a bunch of ammonia, right? Which one will make it shift to the right so that we continue to produce more ammonia? Like I've talked about before, usually the goal of a chemical reaction is to produce your products, right? So if we were doing this commercially, you know, the more ammonia we can make, the better off we're going to be, right? The more profit we make. So we need to figure out, okay, how do I make this reaction go farther to the right? How do I make it make more ammonia? So here's your options. So which of these will make it make more ammonia? Which one will favor the formation of ammonia? Go ahead and pause here and come back when you're ready to hear the answer.
Okay, so let's go ahead and look at these. If I remove N2, right, that's going to decrease our concentration of nitrogen, and that will cause the reaction to shift to produce more nitrogen. So that will make it shift left, and we don't want that, so not that one. If we remove hydrogen, same story, right? Our equilibrium needs to shift to replace our hydrogen, so that one's not right either. If we increase the pressure, right? Remember, when we increase the pressure, we will typically decrease the volume, okay? So if we are decreasing the volume, we wanna to shift to the side with fewer moles of the gas, okay? So this is two on this side, and this is one plus three, which gives us four total on this side. So an increase in the pressure, which decreases the volume, will shift it to the right, which will cause it to make more ammonia. Yay us. We'll go ahead and look at the other ones too. Obviously, if an increase in pressure worked, then a decrease won't. Um, an increase in the temperature. If we increase our energy, right, an increase in the temperature, that will cause it to shift away from the added energy. So it will shift left instead of right like we want it to. So the only one that works here is C. All right, last little bit. Um, I wanna look at, okay, well, what does that do to the equilibrium constant? So here's our reaction. A plus B uh, is in equilibrium with C, and our delta H value is negative 25 kilojoules per mole. So this tells you, right, whether this is exothermic or endothermic. Remember, delta H, right, the sign of it is important. Okay, so... I'll let you think on that for a second. But the reaction above has an equilibrium constant of 3.54 times 10 to the minus fifth at 25 degrees Celsius. If the temperature is increased, what would the effect be on the equilibrium constant? And I wanna know, would it increase, decrease, remain the same, goes to zero, or we don't have enough information to solve the problem. Go ahead and pause here, think about this, and then uh, come back when you're ready to see the answer. Okay, so like I said, the key here is this delta H value. So if we have a negative delta H, that's telling us that it's exothermic, right? And remember, you need to write in plus heat on either the reactants or the products. So since it's exothermic, heat is a product. So we're going to go ahead and write that on the product side. So if I um, increase my temperature, I'm increasing my heat. Right? And when I increase my heat, my reaction will shift away from my added heat to use it up. So an increase in temperature will shift the reaction to the left. So when we shift our reaction to the left, right, we start to make a bunch of reactants by using up our products. So our concentration of our reactants is increasing and our concentration of our products is decreasing. And remember, K is always products over reactants. Okay, so if our reactants are increasing, our products are decreasing, that means we will have a smaller K value. Remember, we've talked about a bunch of times that the equilibrium constant is only constant at a given temperature. So see here, we've changed our temperature. We increased our temperature. And for an exothermic reaction, this will result in a smaller value of K. And that's it. That's the end of Le Chatelier's principle. I hope you got a lot of practice doing this. Um, there is more practice in your chapter 15 lecture worksheet. Um, so I recommend that you work through all of those problems. As always, if you have any questions on the lecture or any of the, um, the worksheet problems or you know any of the problems on your homework, make sure to send them to me so that I can get you some help if you need it. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time.